tail is height. I had the pleasure this past week of having several people tell me that they seen this presentation on television and I asked them why they were watching. They said they were simply surfing and they stayed a few moments with it. Some stayed about five or ten minutes because they found the, <clears throat> the discussion of Bunyan to be somewhat difficult to follow and they hand read the text. Hopefully they'll be encouraged to read the text and knowing that you have already read the text as you come in here I suppose that the material will be more familiar than others but today we're going to discuss a rather remarkable writer by the name of Daniel Defoe and I think that anyone tuning in on this show just passing by would likely be fascinated by what they're going to hear and what they're going to see because there are few writers in literature who have been so prolific or who have lived such interesting lives, or who have written uh, as many works relevant to modernism and to realism as Daniel Defoe. Let's talk about Daniel Defoe for the first part of this uh, ses session. And you'll, be, you'll discover a person who actually fits the dictum of John Milton in his essay on education who says that every man must be prepared for public and private duty in peace and in war. However, Defoe's actions uh, are not always as honorable as we would have hoped they would be. He's expedient in a lot of the matters he's involved with and he's involved in the religious wars to, a, to the extent that he was jailed for them and uh, had to apologize to the courts for them. Well, let's first of all talk about Daniel Defoe. He was born in 1660. The London of a, uh, the, uh, in London, the son of a tallow chandler, someone who made his living uh, making candles and preparing candles. Candles are rather important when you realize that the theater had no lights, for example, and you had to have lights on the stage they could only be made by candles. Um, candles were used much later in the stage to affect sunlight. There were machine, uh, uh, <coughs> Ed, uh, Garrick, the stage manager, later in the century, around 1757, went to France and brought back a steel drum on which he placed candles. And when the drum was rolled toward the stage, it simulated sunlight. And when it was rolled away from the stage, it simulated darkness, but nevertheless, it was all candles. <clears throat> so Daniel Defoe was born in a family of merchants. Now, the merchant class was a very strong class in London in the 18th century, the 17th century. Those who you, you have studied institutional economics know that the development of the middle class in the medieval period uh, simply grew, and in the 18th century, a large portion of the population was able uh, to, to conduct business, small businesses, large businesses. But Defoe's father, at the, name, at the time the family was Foe, was a chandler. Now remember this is 1660. From 1660 to 1672, if you remember those 12 years, where was Bunyan? Bunyan was in jail. He wanted to preach. He couldn't do it for those 12 years. That's where he sat. Then he was out for three or four years, and then he went back in jail for preaching. So these are tempestuous times, and we find that in 1662, the Faux family chose to be Presbyterians even under the Act of Uniformity. The Act of Uniformity required that everyone celebrate Mass by the Anglican Church and read the Book of Common Prayer, the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. Uh, despite these hazards, the foes were Presbyterian. In 1665 and 1666, when Daniel was five and six years old, London suffered two great tragedies. One was the Great Fire of London, which almost burned half of London. We have the story of Samuel Pepys standing at his house, looking across the town and seeing the fire. 
estimating the large number of houses being burned, and because Pepys himself was an entrepreneur, estimating the numbers of rents that were being lost as the houses burned. Pepys had a large supply of gold that he had buried in his, in his yard, and he had dug up the gold for fear that the fire would reach his place, and it would, uh, uh, <coughs> it would uh, melt the gold. Then you had the plague of London. The plague, and, and the plague was uh, a plague that killed tens of thousands of people. Defoe writes about it later in what he calls the Journal of the Plague Year. And he writes so convincingly and he writes so realistically that one almost assumes that he himself was there when the fire, when the plague struck London. Well, he was there, but he was only five or six years old. Now ask yourselves, what in your lives at the age of five and six would move you some 60 years later to write about those adventures and make them meaningful? Well, we'll talk about that when we, when we actually get to that point. From 1671 to 79, he went to school from the 11 to 18, first at the school of Reverend James Fisher, and then at Charles Morton's Academy at Newington Green, which was a school to educate Presbyterian ministers. And uh, in 1683, when he was 23 years old, Defoe was already in business. <clears throat> was selling hosiery, wine, tobacco, and manufacturing bricks and tiles. He was doing very well for himself at the age of 23, and therefore was a good catch for Mary Tuffley, who gave him 3,700 pounds as a diary, magnificent amount of money, and by 1704 they had seven children one of whom died very early, and one of whom, or the, uh, several of whom, caused him great grief toward the end of his life when he found them to be almost impoverished, and he himself could not help them. Now, in 1685, tempestuous times, Charles II died, and James the first, uh, James the second came to the throne of England. Where was Defoe at this time? This 25-year-old uh, uh, entrepreneur. He was in favor of Monmouth. Now, what did that mean? The Duke of Monmouth was the illegitimate son of Charles the second. He was a tall, good-looking general. He was celebrated in war. He uh, would be the type of person who could conceivably run for president of the United States because uh, we have an uh, inkling for generals. We like generals when we have no one else to vote for, and sometimes they turn out to be very strong politicians. But the Duke of Monmouth was the illegitimate son of Charles II. The Whigs had tried very, very hard to legitimize his birth so that he could sit on the throne of England and succeed his father because Monmouth was Protestant. This didn't happen. Charles's brother, James II, came to the throne in 1685 as a Roman Catholic. He uh, met resistance because he started to infiltrate the schools with Roman Catholics and Monmouth raised an army. He raised an army first of 85 people. And then more than 1,000 supporters came to fight with Monmouth. And Daniel Defoe was one of them, one of the 1,200 who joined this group of people leading a rebellion against James II. Well, the English moved rapidly. James moved armies rapidly against these dissidents, 
these uh, anti-Jacobites, you might say, and dispersed the army, pushed the army back into Sedgemoor, where many of the uh, uh, perpetrators, many of the members of Monmouth's army were caught in swampland and captured, and Monmouth himself was captured, hiding behind a brick wall. Monmouth was marched to the gallows within days, and uh, the only thing, as he walked proudly and handsomely to the, to the uh, executioner's block, his head was to be chopped off, he asked his, the executioner only to do it well and to do it fast. The executioner swung once, missed. Swung again, cut Monmouth. And the story is that Monmouth simply looked at him kind of uh, oddly as though he just didn't know what he was doing. And the third time he did the job. Where was Defoe? Somehow Defoe escaped. Somehow Defoe missed the net. Somehow Paula Backshider tells her, us in the biography of uh, the life, Defoe had the luckiest escape of his life, and he was not apprehended among those who were with Monmouth. He did, however, travel throughout England and Europe several days. Now, one of the ways, one of the reasons that Defoe got away was that people simply didn't know where he would be normally. As most people who were in this, involved in the Monmouth attack were actually uh, off their jobs or they're away from their, their homes where they normally would not be. But Defoe was always traveling. He was either conducting business, writing, meeting investors, but he was always away from home more than not, and so his being away didn't seem to be anomalous or to be unusual. In 1687, James II declared liberty of conscience, which was good for the dissenters, but really meant for James that he could pack uh, Roman Catholics in Parliament and in the colleges and in government positions. By 1688, the English were fed up with James II. He fled December 10th, but then had second thoughts and came back. But by December 22nd, he was gone for good. And William of Orange arrived November 6, 1670-1689. William and Mary were offered the crown on February 13th, and Defoe paid and rode on a horse, one of 400 on horses to greet the arrival of William III. That's who he... he he supported the Duke of Monmouth, who was Whig. He supported William and Mary, who were essentially Whig. And uh, he, he had his way. In the meantime, he's still trying to maintain his businesses. And what's he trying to do? He has all kinds of businesses. One of the things was his business with civet cats. Now, any biography will discuss what happened with civet cats. But apparently, the musk, the one can take from civet cats at the, uh, under the tail can be made into a very, fi uh, very fine perfume. And Defoe decided to go to business raising civet cats. He bought 70 cats for 850 dollar, uh, pounds, about uh, t 15 pounds apiece. But he found it uh, odiferous business. He didn't like the odors of the cats. He didn't care about the perfume. And it turned out that uh, he actually spent more money than he earned, most of which he had borrowed. And there was a business deal gone sour, one of many business deals that <coughs> went sour with Defoe. Uh, in some ways, he borrowed a great deal of money from people, more than he had in return. And uh, even to the end of his life, people were trying to recover from his business deals. He also invested in a diving bell. Someone had come up with the idea of, of a diving bell that could allow people to float to the bottom of the channels where they might recover gold from sunken Spanish galleons. And so you have a uh, Defoe investing uh, almost indiscriminately in haphazard schemes, schemes that were not altogether a uh, 
uh, poor, but they didn't work out for him. And by 1692, he was bankrupt and owed 17,000 pounds and vowed to pay it all back. And as far as we know, he did work to pay it all back. But in the meantime, he went to King's Bench Prison and stayed there for about four months, at which time he talks about the horrors of prison. And a, uh, in this particular edition of Maul Flanders, the Northern edition that I asked you to buy that has some very fine essays, one of the essays deals with the kind of life that one found in the prison yards and in the prisons. Uh, if you had money, you could get yourself a private apartment, and you could have guests, and you could have conjugal visits. If you had no money, you were placed in the dungeon where men and women together would uh, consort and Defoe even talks uh, and complains about a situation where men and women are engaged in the uh, acts of copulation with uh, as signs of their sin, as signs of their beggarliness, and as signs of their immorality. In some cases, if a person came to the jail, he was obliged to pay other prisoners a certain sum in order to either stay whole, keep from suffering their, uh, their blows and punishment, or else to keep their clothes. If you didn't have money, the, well, they would take your clothes. So the, the prison was a horrendous place. Uh, and ever afterwards, Defoe writes of prisons with horror and when you find Maul Flanders in prison, you realize, of course, what a terrible situation she has found herself in. In 1697, Defoe writes a book called An Essay on Projects. And this is a rather fascinating piece of literature because he, he knew a great deal about the law. He knew a great deal about economics. And in this essay on projects, he comes up with some very important interesting projects to try to advance his civilization. One project is an academy for women. Most women in the, in the 17th century and 18th century did not read. Defoe urges an academy for women. One of the reasons there were no academies for women was because some of the scholars and some of the churchmen and some of the people believed that women's minds did not afford educational capability. Defoe had no, no question whatsoever that women should be educated, that they should have their own academies, and that they should be uh, fruitful minds given the opportunity to regenerate themselves. He also advocated highway building. He felt that there should be wider highways in the London streets, uh, uh, wider streets and wider highways. And uh, he showed some advance in this regard. He understood modern e economics, modern civil law, the obligation of a city to make its streets passable. He did advocate, however, a way of providing manpower for these highways. He suggested bringing slaves to London. Why? Because they could be, uh, uh, they didn't have to eat a lot, and they would work hard, and you could finance your projects at minimum cost. We know that Defoe was interested in the slave trade. Robinson Crusoe, after all, ends up on a desert island while sailing on a slave uh, uh, mission. Defoe also uh, advocates the idea of a national debt and a national bank. A national debt says you can build now and float bonds so that people who are using your highways and using your facilities decades from this point will be ultimately also paying for the use of this road instead of trying, as kings had to do or people had to do, find the funds originally and have them available in order to build at once. So that modern economics Defoe was familiar with, modern a, uh, <coughs> education Defoe was advocating, 
And the Academy, the Essay on Projects, is really a very, very advanced form of a uh, uh, economic understanding in the end of the 18th uh, at the end of the 17th century. From 1697 to 1701, he was William III's agent in England and Scotland. He actually performed acts for the government, writing papers, and traveling incognito to find out where pockets of political unrest stayed, then he could report them. In other words, very early we have an idea that he was operating as a government spy, but he was, he was actually a Whig uh, working under the employ of William III. In 1701, he wrote a poem called The True Born Englishman. It was rather interesting, it's applicable today, the English were complaining that there were too many foreigners coming into England. There were Dutch coming into England. There were French coming into England. Uh, England was losing its purity. And Defoe, in this very, very long poem, The True Born Englishman, simply goes out to say, All right, we ought to get rid of all the foreigners who came to this land. But then we'll have to get rid of your own parents, those of you who are compl complaining, and you yourselves, because your parents came as foreigners to England. If they came in the 17th century or the 16th century, or they came with a Norman French, anyone who's not Anglo, anyone who's not Pict, uh, anyone who's not Welsh, may then be called a foreigner. And so Defoe says in The True Born Englishman, um, don't complain about who's coming because you're here by virtue of your being allowed in this country. And he goes on to say that if you object to the fact that they come poor, look back in your families and you'll discover that perhaps they were poor. And if they come to this country, you say they're engaged in criminal acts, I dare say, he says, that in your background, you may find family members guilty of such acts whom you have disavowed and you ho or whom you have ignored. And so in The True Born Englishman, Defoe defends aliens coming to the country by saying, you yourselves are among them. But he always had this bent, this ironic bent of turning things about. Now, one of the actions that really hurt Defoe was in 1702, when acts were out to attack, when the English were <clears throat> especially oppressive of the dis dissenters. There were movements to prevent occasional conformity and there were movements to oppress the dissenters. Defoe writes a very long poem called The Shortest Way with the Dissenters. I'm not going to go into that either because we've got, we want to get to Mulf Flanders, but I want to give you some idea of the ironies that Defoe offers us. Defoe says there are various reasons why we should get rid of the dissenters. And he takes the position of a high Tory, he's not, he's Whig, and a high church person, <clears throat> those are the Anglican nobles, the, the bishops of the church, and he's, of course, Presbyterian. But writing from the vantage point of <clears throat> a high churchman and a Tory, he offers ways to get rid of dissenters, and one of the ways he suggests is to crucify them. If you crucify them and make an example of their criminal acts, then they will either turn to the Anglican Church or flee the country. Now, of course, he was being entirely ironical. At first, the Tories said, this is not a bad idea. They said, you know, let us, get, let us come down hard on these people, and then they'll turn back and they'll become Anglicans, or they will leave the country, or they will in some way recant their religious beliefs. 
And this seemed to be a very, very strong position <coughs> until people learned who actually wrote this piece and that it was an attack, an ironical piece upon uh, the Tories themselves. Well, <coughs> under orders of the second Earl of Nottingham, Daniel Fitch, Defoe was captured and again put in jail. But this time, <coughs> he was arrested and confined, and he was designated to stand in the pillory one hour each day for three days in three different parts of London. Now, this may seem to be a rather restful way to spend your punishment. You put your head and your arms in the pillory, it's locked down, and you stand there for a day. The truth of the matter is that anyone standing in the pillory was out of the law. That is, anyone in the pillory could, would not be defended by the police or by the military. So that anyone walking by the pillory could do anything he wanted to anyone standing in the pillory throw tomatoes at him, throw rocks. And there are people who died in the pillory. In especially severe cases, a person whose head was placed in the pillory would have his ear nailed to the wood. And when someone threw objects at him instinctively pulling away, he would either pull off his ear or shear it terribly, suffer traumatic shock, and die in the pillory. Defoe was really quite frightened about standing in the pillory. And uh, he wrote a poem in prison called A Hymn to the Pillory, where he makes three basic statements. One is, many people have stood in this pillory, heroes of their country, but oppressed by the government. And I am one of them. Secondly, he says, the justice of this nation should be used to punish its enemies, not its friends. And third, he indicates people who should be in the pillory who aren't there. Among them, generals who sit on top of a hill and knowing they have to buy time in order to win a battle, send whole militias whole armies into battle, knowing they're going to be murdered, knowing they're going to be mauled, knowing they're going to be killed, says Defoe, these people should be in the pillory, those who plan carelessly and who use their men as decoys for larger action. He says the admirals should be in the pillory, those who know that they've sent a ship into a losing fray, and from shore Watch the ship go down with a thousand sailors drowned. Now, mind you, Defoe is not anti-military. He fought for Monmouth against James II. He defended William III. He'd ride anywhere with the opportunity, but because he's also a satirist, he knows how to attack uh, immoral action. And finally he says, put in the pillory the paymasters who get incredibly rich paying the salaries of the soldiers, taking money, padding payrolls, appointing people to high positions who return a segment of their salaries to them. All these devices, none of which of course occur in the 20th century. Uh, Defoe says, should pe put people in the pillory. Well, so many people read this and applauded him and recognized what he was doing that each time he stood in the pillory, his friends circled him and prevented him from harm. Now, we're not sure how he got out of jail, and we didn't know how he got out of j jail until people looked at Portland papers in the 20th century, and then we discovered that Robert Harley, who was the Prime Minister of England and a Tory, decided to enlist Defoe's help. And clandestinely, or through clandestine means, he made an agreement whereby 
Defoe would serve him as a spy. That's on the one hand. Defoe actually went into Scotland before the Union of Scotland and England in 1707 and would report events that uh, occurred in Scotland that would enable the British to put out brush fires for those people who opposed the Union of Scotland and England in 1707. So he played a very valuable role. I believe he was up there pretending to be a brick maker looking for a place to install his brick kilns and to open up a factory. In other words, he was going to create jobs in Scotland and so he had a lot of entree into uh, the business world there. Uh, he also was asked by the Harley administration we know to continue his work for Whig journals such as the Myths, J the Myths Journal but to soften criticism against the government. I guess the an equation would be a friend of Gordon Liddy's, you see, who was bought by the government, who would go to Liddy and say, on your next program, don't be so harsh on government policies. I mean, some of this is going to help your friends. They're going to get contracts. And if you oppose them so bitterly, these contracts are going to disappear. And so he would, his friend would persuade uh, talk show hosts to reduce the, their invective and the level of their criticism of the government. Well, that's essentially what Defoe did. He wrote for the Whig journals, but reduced the level of criticism that they are leveling against the government. Now, you may consider that immoral. You may consider that casuistic. You may consider that self-serving. But Defoe was not uh, inimical to any of those characteristics. All right, a few more details. If you want to find out what's happening in England from 1704 to 1713, one magazine you can read, and it's a good, it's a good idea for a paper for this class, go to Defoe's Review. We have the complete review in our library. Uh, he wrote it weekly from, for eight years by himself, and what you have in there are discussions of politics, discussions of historical events, discussions of the wars, discussions of politics in Defoe's review. And I want you to really take advantage of that because uh, we have the, the book in facsimile and so much of what Defoe says, so much of what he believes, so much of what he really honestly deals with is in this magazine called The Review. Uh, we have a critical paper coming up, three to five pages, and uh, I'll talk about it in a, in a little while, but anyone who wants to read this as a prelude uh, certainly may do it. I think looking at first-hand materials, primary materials, is an essential way to develop an understanding in the period. In 1750, I want to, I want to move over there, in 1715, Defoe wrote a rather remarkable book called The Family Instructor. Now, let me tell you something about The Family Instructor. The Family Instructor, apart from Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, was one of the most popularly read books in the 18th century. What was it all about? In 1714, the attack on the dissenters reached its apogee. Queen Anne was a Tory, a high church woman, and she despised the dissenters. She wanted to make the ultimate play for the strength of the Anglican Church as she was getting older and moving toward the end of her reign. She actually died a year later. What did Defoe do in the family instructor? Well, what, it was a reaction to what Queen Anne did. Queen Anne insisted that a schism act be passed. This is S-C-H-I-S-M. The schism act was passed. The schism means a split. And she didn't want to split. And in this act she ruled that dissenters could no longer practice religion in churches, not even in the churches, not even in their homes. 
any dissenter practicing or teaching uh, the Protestant religion other than by the Anglican Church would be fined and could be jailed. Now, that's fairly extreme. So extreme that Tories like Richard Steele opposed it. He wrote the he was part of the, one of the, one of the team who wrote the Tatlund Spectator. Tories like Steele opposed it. Defoe wrote Steele a letter congratulating him and complimenting him on this action. But Queen Anne, against all opposition, wanted this act passed, and it was passed. But not before Defoe decided he's going to write a book called The Family Instructor that allows the centers to take family instructors in their home without inhibition. And this is actually a novel. But let me tell you one of the episodes of the novel because Defoe is a compelling writer. In The Family Instructor, he tells us stories about the affairs of husbands and wives, parents and children, masters and apprentices, fathers and sisters, maids and children. It's a panoply of the fourth commandment, honor thy father and mother, which always has, if you read the complete phrase in the Hebrew scriptures, not only are you to honor your father and mother, but they are to honor you too. It's supposed to be a double reaction where everyone, servants, masters, husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, siblings, parents, all show mutual respect. And so this is a series of stories, very compelling stories. The first set came out in 1715, when the Schism Act was passed. The second volume came out in 1718, both very, very popular. And let me tell you one of the stories in this, just to show you the kind of storyteller Defoe is. The story is told about a brother and sister who decide that they want to go out in a stagecoach on the Sabbath. They want to take the coach on their Sabbath. Daddy says, uh-uh, on the Sabbath, you pay attention to your religion, nothing frivolous. They want to show off their fine clothes. They come from a very nice family. Father says, nope, you're not supposed to be vain on the Sabbath. You stay home with us. Well, the brother and sister decide that they really want to get out and walk the mall on Sunday. And they decide to test their father first by sneaking out into the garden and hiding. And when the servant comes running out and reports to them that the father is furious that they're not there, they come back and, of course, the father is mollified. However, they're not any better, any happier with this solution. And so the brother and sister one, one day decide both to leave. The brother leaves on his own. The sister comes back in about four hours. But the brother has left. He has disobeyed his parents. By the way, Robinson Crusoe disobeys his parents. And disobedience becomes one of the sins. The son goes into the army, takes a commission in the army, but through irresponsibility and through errant action, he loses his commission and goes overseas where he is a, 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 an enlisted man. He enters into battle in the War of the Spanish Netherlands and loses an arm. And there he is lying in Europe, a prisoner, sick, incapacitated, and he writes back to his sister in England and says, I need to come home. I'm ready to come home. I'm ready to reconcile myself with my father. The sister goes to the father and says, you must forgive your son. You must have him come home. Now this is where a storyteller becomes paramount. The son comes home and the father sets up an apartment where he can recuperate. But the father fully expects the son to come to visit him on his way to his apartment. The stagecoach driver doesn't know that this is his mission. And he passes by the father's house, at which point the son feels 
the father still has not forgiven him. And he goes to the house, his apartment, hard-hearted, angry with his father, and while his father is still wondering why his son never came to visit him and thinks his son purposely didn't come to visit him. In the meantime, the sister goes to the house, nurses her brother back to health, at which point he falls into dissolute ways, backslides in Bunyan's terminology, and finally finds himself dying in his dissipation. And on his deathbed, he pleads to see his father so he can beg forgiveness. And his father is away on a business trip. And that's the story. I mean, it's a compelling story. It just, it just travels through 300 pages in which these events occur and other events convolute. Uh, another story has a young boy uh, turn to his, uh, who has a slave, a young boy who has a slave, his age. And he wants to know from his father and mother why the young boy doesn't go to church with him. And the father says, I don't know. And the young boy embarrasses the parents into bringing their black slave to church where the young boy is catechized and then baptized. Now there's a whole issue there because Defoe is literally saying our job paramount as religionists is to save souls. It doesn't matter whether these are slaves or whether they're indigent or whether they are sinful. Let's save their souls first. And so the story the family instructor has to do with the salvation of souls. There's one other episode in the story that I want to mention to you before we move on. I'll tell you why this is important. Uh, at one point, an Anglican woman is married to a dissenter husband, and they're always arguing. And the husband says, my dear wife, why must we argue if we can't get along in our own household, how do you expect a nation to get along? Now, obviously, you know what Defoe is doing. This is a political polemic and an effort to try to get toleration for the dissenters. And he says, let's go out to the garden, dear. And she says, well, I'm going out this door. He says, well, you always go out the door opposite the one I go out. He says, but my dear, we both may go out different doors, but we all end up in the same garden together. We both end up in the same garden together. And again, the implication is, whatever your belief, whichever door you go out, Defoe was the center, and he's worried about these Anglicans who are always, always oppressing him. Whichever door you go out, you're going to end up in heaven together. And that's his message. So in the long run, you've got a very interesting man, desirous of toleration, because he didn't experience it. Now the interesting thing is this. The day... The Schism Act went into effect, oppressing the dissenters. Queen Anne died. And it never did take effect. No one enforced it. And by 1718, it was a no longer in force. This didn't mean the political wars were over. But it did mean, to a large extent, although Defoe had some very serious court problems at this time. Uh, he was less interested in the wars than he was in moving into a different type of writing. About this time, a man by the name of Alexander Selkirk was rescued from a deserted island. And the, the story so interested Defoe that Oh, it's so interesting in England that Richard Steele wrote an episode about Alexander Selkirk first, and then at the age of 59 years, Daniel Defoe wrote Robinson Crusoe, probably the most famous book in the history of the world other than the Bible. 
translated certainly as much as the Bible. And may interest to know, those of you who haven't read it yet, that the foe was on the desert island for 24 years before he met Friday. After 20 years, he saw the footprint. After 24 years, he found Friday. And three years later, he was off the island. But that's another story, and we're not going to get into that. In 1720, at the age of 60, he is writing Memoirs of a Cavalier, Captain Singleton, and he's contributing to a journey, uh, to a journal. Then in 1722, he has a remarkable year in writing. He writes Maul Flanders, a book we're going to talk about in just a few moments. He writes a religious courtship, and he writes a journal of the plague year. Now, the journal of the plague year was the history of the plague, presumably written by someone who was there, although we now know that Defoe was only five years old when the plague occurred. But the journal of the plague year deals with how people responded to knowledge of a plague. Uh, Paula Backscheider, who has recently published an edition of the Journal of the Plague Year, has an essay at the end of it in which she, in which one writer compares the AIDS problems today with the feelings people had in the plague in the uh, 17th century. And one of the characteristics of the Journal of the Plague Year is that Defoe tells us that people in one part of town hear rumors about what happens in another part of town. In another part of town, he hears of maids who are supposed to help their victims, who know they're dying, who smother their victims ex to expite their, expedite their deaths and to enable themselves to flee the death house as soon as they can. He describes pits being dug where death carts come and drop massive, uh, a massive number of bodies into the pit, covering them with lime and slowly filling up these pits because the only way you can prevent the spread of the plague is by burying the bodies that are infected. He describes a woman, a mother, who wakes up one morning, looks at her daughter in bed, and sees black splotches on the daughter's essentially in the lymph system and realizes her daughter's going to die and she commits suicide herself knowing that she has now witnessed her daughter's death. He describes draymen who sequester their families on ships off dock, off the dock to try to protect themselves against the plague who work for their, their families, who collect food for the families, and who leave the, family, the, the food at the dock so that they don't contaminate their families and the families can't be contaminated by them, only to discover that the plague has spread to their families whom they've sought to protect. The interesting thing is that Defoe looks upon these events as part of the spiritual autobiography of England because a popular belief was, and Stephen Vincent, in a, one of the writers of the period, tells us that this is retribution against England, the English believed, for having executed Charles I and having contributed and fostered civil war. So there's a very strong belief that many of the actions that occur are, uh, uh, are the result of God's bringing vengeance upon the people for actions against him and for sins against belief. So many of the statements, many of the events that appear in the Journal of the Plague Year, you have to remember that Defoe's a fiction writer. He wasn't there when it happened that, to the extent that he could know it all, although he read a great deal about it. What did he, uh, where else did he get his material? 
part of the novel comes from Thucydides' account of the plague of Athens. And you wouldn't think it. Because like any writer of historical fiction, he uses the facts of the past and makes them meaningful at present. Well, the Journal of the Plague Year is an interesting novel. It doesn't read as a novel. It reads as a factual account. But no one, people writing about AIDS today are giving us, in many cases, the same accounts, uh, apocryphal accounts, as well as realistic accounts. In 1724, he writes Roxana, the story of a, a woman of a uh, high fashion and a high-priced whore. Uh, she's the alter ego of Mal Flanders. In 1726, I'm going to be finishing with this in a few moments, in 1726 he writes two important acts, books. One is called The Political History of the Devil. We have it in our rare book room, the edition, on the eighth floor of the library, and anyone can go up there and study the political history of the devil that way. It has an interesting premise. The devil has been absent from the world for 400 years. He comes back to discover that men are conducting evil deeds without having consulting him and blaming him for their actions. And the poor devil discovers that men are capable of designing far more heinous acts that he himself could ever devise. He's just nonplussed by this. In addition, this book is a criticism of Milton's Paradise Lost. Uh, it's probably the most severe criticism of Paradise Lost. Defoe didn't think Paradise Lost was an epic. He said an epic is supposed to deal with the native uh, materials of your country. And says Defoe, and I may have repeated to you, this to you uh, on another occasion, but Defoe says it's very difficult to picture heaven and hell when they both look like Italy. He goes on to say that in addition, there are an awful lot of trappings that we don't need. He says, for example, in, the, in, in, in Paradise Lost, uh, Christ puts on armor against the devil and leads an army against him. He says, and everyone knows that he doesn't need armor and he doesn't need an army. But he says, Milton gives us all these trappings, and I guess we have to deal with them. Incidentally, uh, Defoe lived on the same street as Milton. And when Milton died, I believe Defoe was 14 years old, he probably watched the funeral procession. Many years later, he puts another nail in Milton's coffin with the political history of the devil. The last important work I want to mention to you at this point is a book called Conjugal lewdness. C O N J U J A L L E W D N E S. It's right here. Conjugal lewdness. It sounds like something pornographic. Uh, it really isn't. What it is, is an advocacy of improved divorce laws. Defoe was more rigid than Milton in divorce laws. But he felt that if two people married and then became incompatible, they should be allowed to divorce. Because, he says, more rapes occur in marriage than out of marriage. Now, we're very conscious today of the kinds of marital abuse that can bring people to trial. And so if you want to study the advocacy for divorce laws, for releasing people from uncompromising situations, then read Conjugal Lewdness. It's a very telling, illustrative argument over the kinds of actions people take in their lives in the 18th century that merit more liberal divorce laws. I'm not advocating divorce laws, but I am saying to you that a, uh, we have some riches in our library at the University of Houston. We have 
a third edition of Robinson Crusoe, a first edition of The Political History of the Devil, and an a facsimile edition of Conjugal Lewdness that will give you some entree into the works of Daniel Defoe. A fairly fascinating figure. Unfortunately, at the end of his life, like Shakespeare, he was having trouble with his children. Shakespeare didn't like the guy his daughter married. Thought he was worthless. Uh, Defoe had different problems. He, his daughter Sophia, he gave 500 pounds to as a diary, as a dowry, plus 5% interest, but only after he died. So he expected to leave some money for her. Unfortunately, he had a problem at the end of his life where those people who he was involved with, with the Civet Cats and other business deals in 1692, uh, I'm sorry, I thought I had the names right in front of me, but I don't have them here. But Paula Backshotter discusses them in the biography, and so does uh, James Sutherland and Lee. A number of biographies deal with this. The widow of the executor of the estate of the people who owned the Civet Cats in 1692 pressed charges against Defoe. And at the end of his, toward the end of his life, he was found, uh, he lost a civil case in court and owed Mary Brooke 800 pounds. But this was for, this was in 1731, 1731 for affairs that had taken place in 1690, 1692. This 800 pound settlement against him meant that he lost everything. He had no property, probably no property to give to his, uh, uh, his daughter. His older son was relatively wealthy and a good businessman, but apparently refused to give money to either Defoe's wife or to his three daughters who were almost impoverished. And so at the end of his life, he was really very unhappy with the way his children were treating each other. He himself had a major settlement against him and may have gone to jail. And at the end of his life, he was moving from house to house rather than staying at home to escape being served at a, a warrant to go to jail again. And then on April 24th, he died. His wife died a year later. I married toughly. Well, what I've tried to present to you is a man who, first of all, is a great writer. Second of all, a person absolutely involved in the political and governmental affairs, economic affairs of his times. There was no separation in the 18th century of writers from their civilization, writers from their politics, writers from their government, writers from their economic situation. They were heavily immersed and none more than Daniel Defoe. Now what impelled him after 1715 when he wrote The Family Instructor? It was a series of dramatic dialogues like Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. The Family Instructor was printed in America by Benjamin Franklin, who complimented Defoe on imitating John Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress. And that's one of the reasons why I have Defoe following Bunyan because not only are they dissenters, but there are very some similarities in the kind of message they're trying to deliver, which is the way of survival in a world where one's spirit may be assaulted and where, where one's soul must be saved. Now I'm going to go in for a few moments now to discuss Moll Flanders, which is the novel you're scheduled to read uh, as the second work in this course. At this point, let me take a moment to describe to you what I may want from you for this first paper due in two weeks. By the way, if there are people in West Houston, would you say hello and tell me how many people are there? If anyone's in West Houston, press your microphone and say hello. Is there anyone in North Houston who is there who would like to say hello? 
Or maybe you're shy. I don't know. There's supposed to be five people at each place. And I assume you're there. Well, maybe you've decided to watch this on cable instead. I, I see all kinds of people watching this on cable saying hello. This paper that you're going to write, three to five pages in length, can uh, take Pilgrim's Progress or Moll Flanders or Tristram Shandy, which is the third novel we're going to be looking at. And you may write on any third of those works. That is, I don't want you to write about the whole work. But pick either the first 75 pages, or the middle 75 pages, or the last 75 pages. Read those pages very, very carefully. And then comment upon them. And what you'll do is essentially this. And if I can have the uh, camera focus on this pad, I'll just write it down. The first thing you're going to do is provide a summary of the main events. but only the first third, the second third, or the third third. If you're going to discuss the first third of the novel, you're not going to talk about the end of the novel. And if you're going to talk about the middle of the novel, you're not going to talk about the beginning of the end. You're going to find salient details, important details, in your section. I would rather you focus on a very small part of the work and be detailed then be vague in a larger part. The second thing you're going to do is isolate two or three central themes. The salvation of the soul, the unity of family, the nature of toleration, some event or some idea that presents itself. And then the third thing you're going to do is describe how these events apply in situations you yourself have experienced, situations you yourself have experienced. So one part of your paper will deal with the main events of the work that you're focusing on. Another part will pick out central themes. And the third will take some experience that you yourself have had, and very specific experience, related to the material you've learned in the text. In other words, to demonstrate that the, there is some reach between the 18th century and the 17th century and the 20th century. The important thing is to be very detailed, to be detailed about what you find in Defoe, in Bunyan, or in Stern, and to be detailed about your own experience too. And if your own experience merely means reading the newspaper about some horrible event that seems to remind you of the circumstances of this novel, be very detailed. Give me names, give me dates, give me circumstances. Give me what Defoe and Bunyan give, specific concrete details. Any questions about this for this first paper? Just bring it to class. It must be double-spaced. Please use 10-point type on your typewriter. 
I had someone last semester turn in a eight-page paper in 24-point type. I figured that was a little bit too much. If you borrow from any sources, if you go to the library and you find people who are stating some of these ideas, then you're obliged, of course, to footnote and document your paper. And the documentation will be according to the modern language style book, which is one of the books you presumably bought for this course. Are there any questions? If any of you wants to show me any section of your paper prior to turning it in, I'm certainly amenable to looking at it and giving you my opinion about it. Please type these papers and uh, uh, give me one inch margins around left and right. I don't need three inch margins. I've all been very impressed with papers that have been turned in in the past and I always go on the assumption that you are giving me the best paper I'm going to look at. I always look at each paper with a full expectation that it's going to earn an A. Sometimes you give me reason to change my mind, but I always reach the paper and say, this is going to be an A paper when I pick it up and start reading it. And then if there are disadvantageous points in the paper or you don't present a good argument or your argument seems to be faulty, I'll never disagree with your argument. Whatever viewpoint you take, that's your argument. The only thing I'm ever concerned about is whether you've proven it, you see. You may give me a viewpoint totally antithetical to what I myself would, would, would say, but that's not my concern. My concern is how well you deliver an argument. Now, let's talk about Mall Flanders and see what kind of book it is that we're dealing with. The original title is a rather interesting one. It says, these are the fortunes and misfortunes of the famous Mal Flanders who was born in Nougat. And during a life of continued variety for three score years, besides her childhood, was 12 years a whore, five times a wife, thereof once to her own brother, 12 years a thief, eight years a transported felon in Virginia, at last grew rich, lived honest, and died a penitent. Written from her own memorandums. Now, that's the title. What kinds of a life did a woman like this leave, live in the 18th century? Let me show you some drawings. This was written in 1722. In 1731, a man by the name of Hogarth wrote a progress narrative using engravings. Now, progress poem in the 17th century is a poem that takes you from the beginning of a person's experiences to the end, usually from a point of fortune to a point of misfortune. And there is a series of drawings called The Harlot's Progress, which was written by, which was designed by a, an artist by the name of William Hogarth. So give me a few moments to show you uh, these engravings by one of England's major writers, the major artists, and that's William Hogarth. Da, 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 da. I, I, that's the music. I'll supply my own music, you see. You dramatic interlude. When you watch movies and TV programs, you really don't really realize how much the music affects you. But there we have the harlot's progress. Now, here is a young lady 
who has come to London. She's innocent. Notice her little innocent hat. You see, that's her little innocent hat. This is the sign of innocence. She's blushing. And she's come to an inn. She's come to an inn. Now, we know what kind of inn. This is the Bell Tavern, a very infamous tavern in London. You see the bell. You see the bell, and you see this checkerboard design. That means they sell whiskey. We have a few more moments to look at this. But here's a little innocent girl coming from York. York is written on the carriage, and there's her father riding a horse. Believe it or not, she is meeting here one of the famous madams of England, Mother Needham, who, and we can tell by the portrait of her face. And behind her is Lord Charteris, one of the Prime Minister's leading aides, who was convicted of seducing a teenager and raping her. He was saved from jail because he knew Robert Walpole. But once you see this little girl in the hands of this infamous woman and this infamous man, you know she's on her way to a life of harlotry. And after the break, we'll see what else happens to Molly Hackabout. That is her name. Notice here that the horse is eating hay, and there are dishes stacked up near the hay, and those dishes are about to break. And when those dishes break, so does her virtue. And that is the iconography of Hogarth's The Harlot's Progress. Let's see if we can see the horse eating the dishes. Oh, you see? Eating the hay and the, and the pottery is falling over. Well, that suggests that she is going to lose her virtue. Hello? That is a matter of the iconography of 18th century art as it is of Renaissance art. Hello? When Lord Charters died, people were so incensed with him and with his immorality that they threw dead dogs and cats in his grave. We'll resume with uh, the harlot's progress and then talk about Mall Flanders after the break. <laughs> 